Hey, Olivia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar, and I'm excited to get a chance to uh, collaborate with so many great teachers and educators this afternoon. We are going to talk about guided reading, and so I appreciate the introductions, and I look forward to hearing from uh, each of you if you have questions along the way. Uh, we're, today, we're going to really talk about successful readers and writers and what it takes. That's our daily challenge. When I'm out in my schools working, I know that teachers are always trying to figure out what they can do to help their students to be better readers and writers because that is our main job. So what does it take? You know, we know it takes this. It takes scaffolding and it takes supporting our learners. And scaffolds are hard to do because sometimes we view scaffolds as, as crutches uh, that, don't, that might not go away. However, we're trying to put things into place so that our students will become independent readers and writers. Uh, so it kind of boils down to this. This is probably the reason you guys are here, you know, strategically organized, well managed, scheduled. Wow. How do we make all that happen? That is definitely a challenge that each of us encounter on daily basis when it comes to trying to figure out how we, how do we do it all? Because teachers are supposed to be able to do it all. Definitely have superpowers, but sometimes we're always scratching our heads trying to figure out how to make it to that next step. So it boils down to classroom management. How do we manage those classrooms? This is one of my favorite ways to put it when I, when I talk with other teachers. You know, classroom management is about understanding the difference between Andy and Barney. And I'm sure that each of you know who Andy and Barney are and know about Mayberry, but I think it comes down to the difference between being a person who acts, acts, versus a person who reacts. You know, we know Barney always reacts to everything, and Andy was always the one who would act. He would uh, take Opie under his wing. He would let him struggle meaningfully. He would teach him lessons. He would uh, plan for something so that Opie could learn from that. And, and the same thing with the other people he encountered in the story, whereas, you know, Barney was kind of like the bull in the china shop. It's all about what he needed to do right now, and he had that bullet in his pocket. So sometimes we encounter and, and we approach our guided reading, our classroom management that way. Uh, but then we also approach it so that we don't have a life, but I'll go back to Helen Crump, who of course was uh, Opie's teacher and Andy's girlfriend. So she had time for life. She had time for a real world life, uh, even in the, uh, the, reality, the reality of the, the fantasy that um, Andy of Mayberry was. So as teachers, we want that. We need to have a life. So how do we make sure that we're getting the right things done without staying to, at school till six and seven o'clock every night or taking all those bags home and working? Because we know this, guided reading is the key. It is huge to support and accelerate student reading growth. We know that's got to happen. We can't just make it all happen in whole group. It will not happen. And we certainly don't have time to do one-on-one -on -one teaching every day with every student we have. It's all about student growth. And this is something that somebody shared with me uh, several years ago that really uh, made me sit up and think. The fact that student growth isn't a strategy. It's a result. It's not a strategy. It's not about a strategy. It's not about this. It is a result. What is the result of? Well, it's a result of these things. Engaging, focused, motivational, highly effective, connected, and sustaining instruction. That's what it is. It's all about instruction. So when we think about guided reading, we have to think about our instruction as a whole in our day. You know, I love this little quote from John Hattie, who is also one of my heroes who uh, wrote Visible Learning for Teachers and several other books, along with my colleague, uh, Doug Fisher, just recently. And what he said was, my role as teacher is to evaluate the effect that I have on my students. Well, that's something we have to think about. So, you know, in the next time, little time we have today together, I want us to think about how do we evaluate that? How do we know what our role is as teachers? And how do we evaluate what we do and how it does have an effect on our, our students? So everything we do does make a difference. This is also kind of a, a profound statement, and this is, this is definitely fact. Teachers are the single most important factor in accelerating reading growth. They don't learn it from their grandmas. They don't learn it from their moms and dads. Unfortunately, very, very little of it. They can practice it, but they don't learn it from other sources. They just simply don't have enough time. There's not enough resources there. They learn it at school. They learn. They, so we are the single most important factor in accelerating that reading growth. No pressure, of course, but it does. We, that's where they learn that. 
And it's all about that learning. And I got to say that I, I love the fact that when you think about it, that learning happens in that space between teachers and students. It's that little space. I love that picture there. Just someone took that picture when I was doing a guided reading group uh, one day and I was like, wow. And that little boy, I'm telling you that he's one of those goosebump moments for me that day because he had something that clicked and I realized that learning took place because we had that time together in that group setting, that small group setting to make that happen. It's all about being able to, to look into their heads and, and hear what they say and hear what they read and know what I can do to help them next. Because academic success is not about the ability of our students. It's truly about our ability to teach them. So the more savvy we get, the more informed we get, uh, the more uh, we feel comfortable with what we do, the more likely it is that we're going to be successful with their academic success. So two of the major things I always follow when I am working with kids in classrooms and when I'm training teachers and, and coaching them, I tell them we need the two big E's. These are things that can make our, our teaching successful in, in all of our settings in our classrooms. Number one, we need to engage our kids. And by engage, uh, I know we hear that all the time, but, but this is kind of like my real world definition of that. We engage them by getting their buy-in. That means we do things that make them want to do this. They know, they need to know why. Every time a kid is doing something, they need to know why. So I have learned to step back and evaluate myself to see if I'm truly laying that down. So they, so I'm engaging them, I'm getting their buy-in and then I'm empowering them. I'm giving them ownership. It's not about what we know. It's about what they know and what they are processing. And so we can engage them, get their buy-in and empower them, give them ownership because they, they got to be readers and writers on their own. And that is our goal. We want to do teaching that sticks. When we think about this, we think about, uh, I love this quote from uh, Nancy Fry and Doug Fisher, who said that transfer doesn't just happen. The experiences that a teacher intentionally creates helps to foster that transfer. And that is, after all, what we want. You know, we work hard. We teach them. We want them to learn. Just teaching does not, will not be the end all be all. There has to have that learning, that transfer piece so they can sustain it to other texts. And without a doubt, focus is key. So when we talk about guided reading day, we're going to talk about focus. How do I make sure I have a focus? Because if I don't, that's pretty much what learning looks like. Many times we're trying to do too much in a guided reading group. This is what happens. When we try to do too much in any type of lesson, this is what happens. We're all over the place. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is kind of how I like to put it with teachers. This is us. Yes, people, we are the monkey. And yes, see that elephant coming at us 500 miles an hour? That is truly student achievement. That is a student being able to, to be college career ready. That is a student being able to uh, transfer those things we're teaching them and sustain them into other texts. And that can be done through guided reading. Guided reading is one of the most important things of our day. So Kathy, I have a couple of questions for you. Okay, I thought you um, First, I wanna know what is guided reading and then why is it so important? Well, that's, that's, that's a great question because there's lots of definitions out there of what guided reading is. So let's just talk about a real world teacher definition. You know, it's a teaching approach. It's designed to help individual readers build an effective system for processing a variety. And this is important of increasingly challenging text, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> over time. So it's not about just seeing how fast they can read. It's not about just seeing uh, how many books they can read. It's about building that system for processing increasingly challenging texts over time because they live in the 21st century. It's the bridge. It's that time. It's that bridge between what I'm doing in whole group, what I'm doing in many lessons and the independent practice. You know, when they go away and they're reading, unfortunately, our classroom, sometimes we have many fake readers. We've got kids that are good at it. Guided reading is that way to bridge that whole group instruction we give them and what they're going to do when they walk away because sometimes they're not ready to go away and do it on their own. As a matter of fact, most of the time they're not. So it's kind of like between their awareness of what, what they're supposed to be doing and then their self-monitoring of knowing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, why do we need guided reading? Because they have a learning zone. Our kids have learning zones. Our, everybody has learning zones between what the learner can do independently and what the learner can do with the support of an expert other. Unfortunately, we can't follow our kids. 
from place to place. This is all about scaffolding versus rescuing. Um, independent reading and the application of independent reading structures, that's the why. That's the goal of, of guided reading, what they can do with that. And it's working toward complex, high-level reading comprehension. See, again, they live in the 21st century, global economy. In order to be successful in this world, they have to know how to read and understand what they're reading. This is one of the things that I had to learn. I had to learn that guided reading is not an exercise to just practice reading skills. I'm read recovery trained. I wouldn't take that training for, away from myself or the world because it helped me to understand the, those many facets of what a reader does. And it's not just practicing reading skills. It's about learning how to be a reader and why they need to be a reader. Okay, I have another question for you. No, how do teachers question. know who need guided reading? That's a great question. And that's one of the things that, that we struggle with, you know, who needs it in my room? I've got, you know, I've got, I had a teacher tell me the other day, I have 28 kids, Kathy. I said, I know, I see that. <clears throat> she said, I have all these levels in here, you know, who, you know, what, how do I balance my time out? You know, who needs it? You know, do these kids, maybe they don't need it. They're on grade level. <clears throat> and so what I say is, you know, okay, who needs guided reading in my class? Well, this is what we know. We know students who are, and I like to call them fragile learners. You know, they're below grade level. They're struggling for different reasons. Uh, it could be our ELL, ESL students have limited language and literacy. It could be students who have other issues. Let me just say this. That those kids definitely need it, and they need it every day. They need that time every day in a small group, or sometimes they even need a little bit of one-on-one, -on -one, a couple minutes of one-on-one -on -one and then small group. Uh, so we know that that's kind of like common sense. That's like, that's like a duh -huh. I know that. But let me also say this, students who are on above grade level, they still need guided reading. I need opportunities to hear all of my students read at some point uh, during the day, maybe for a couple of minutes. I definitely need, I might only have my own level and above level uh, guided reading groups every, every other day, or at least a couple times a week where I have them because they need to learn how to read deeply rather than just surface. Sometimes those kids are the ones that are, that are read, I call them, uh, zoo readers they read so fast they feel like they're they're zooming through it they need to learn to be savvy at navigating different genres so i need to introduce them to different genres i need to introduce them to different text types so they can develop and deepen, deepen their proficiency too so i guess the answer to that olivia is everybody in my class needs it i just know i have to spread my time out so that it's uh, so that it's what each of my students needs and i can group them that way you know, because I got to provide that explicit instruction. I got to coach them in accurate, fluent, and reading comprehension. So, you know, I got to create engagement that we talked about. I got to engage them. Uh, and I've got to motivate them to want to read so that when they go away, they've had that chance with me to ask questions for me to see what they can do, what, they, what I need to help them with next. But this is what's key. I need to make sure that it's short, focused, and purposeful. And the first word is really important. Guided reading needs to be done in a brief amount of time. It doesn't need to be long, drawn out, spread out. It needs to be done in a very focused and purposeful manner. And it needs to be brief to the point that uh, students get just what they need to take away and practice on their own. Uh, we'll talk about this as we go about, about the different uh, time uh, allotments for, for that reading piece, but definitely it does not need to be, uh, it's just like a mini lesson. The mini lesson should be a mini lesson. Uh, we do things in our classrooms in, in chunks, in meaningful chunks that students can take in and process and give them a chance to practice that through that gradual release. Okay, I couldn't, I couldn't hear your question, but I, I, I know, I know what, what you're asking. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Can you explain the steps of a general guided reading lesson to us? Okay, yeah, absolutely, because it's important to realize how it's organized, because it, if anything is organized beginning, middle, and end, it pretty much is guided reading. You know, on my website, by the way, I'm going to be offering and, and, and telling the folks that are participating that uh, there are multiple resources on my website. Uh, they are free. Um, 
I share them out willingly. I pay them forward. Um, and this is one of them. This is uh, one of my guided reading maps that I have. It's like a general map. It talks about beginning, middle, and end. So these are just some of the things that it contains. Understanding that this is general. This doesn't take into consideration <clears throat> some of the extra things you have to do with emergent challenging readers or even some of the things you want to do at the end with uh, those higher end readers. But let's talk about what you do before reading. Uh, before reading is that time that you're trying to set set up what you're going to be doing. And let me just say, this is something for me. Well, too many times I've seen teachers spend as much as 10 and 15, shoot, 20, 30 minutes, I swear, doing skill and drill. They think they're doing the right thing and they're trying to do the right thing. But what happens is it leaves students exhausted. It leaves you exhausted and it leaves them little time to read text themselves and guided reading. They need to be reading some text themselves. More of that responsibility is on them. I'm coaching. So I'm just setting the purpose. I'm giving a quick preview and I'm scaffolding as needed. That's pretty much what you need. Uh, before reading, got to make sure that you got that designated area. Where am I going to have it? And that could be, they could be having it in the floor on a rug, but they, there needs to be a place where they come to, where they know where to come to. Uh, I'm setting that state, that purpose, the expectations. Expectations is important. Uh, I have my materials ready. We'll go into that a little more later. Uh, I'm teacher ready. I have, I have my little guided reading bag. I have my little toolkit uh, that even when I'm uh, across this country, I, one of the things I take in my bags is my little get ready bag because I got to have those things. I got to be ready when it starts because my time is of, of essence and I'm going to set that purpose and I'm going to let them know what we're reading and why we're reading it. And I'm going to give them those look fors and my kids are going to be ready. They're going to have their text. They're going to have their own little things so that they have accountability too. It's not about spray and pray turn guided reading. It's about them having an opportunity to come and hone those skills and, and to get better at it. And my intro is brief and it's focused and I'm just going to try to set that positive motion. And I tell teachers all the time, you know, fake it do you believe it. You should, you should receive an Academy Award for how you kick off a small group reading lesson because you want them to be excited about it. You know, you got to prepare to differentiate. You know, if we've got those emergent readers, we might be working on writing sight words and table writing and mix it, fix it, and, and manipulating letters around. Uh, but then when I've got my other kids I, they, that don't need that, then I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to be doing other types of intro things with them and setting that purpose. You know, I think the key thing here is when you start a guided reading group that you have clarity and purpose and task. You know before you get there what you're gonna be doing with them or where you kinda of wanna go. And then you let them know what that purpose is, you know, briefly with clarity. During reading, wow. Well, as you can see, that's all about making sure that you are getting a chance to listen in. This is one of my favorite things to tell teachers. During reading is all about this. The quieter you become, the more you can hear. Less teacher talk. As a matter of fact, there's m very minimal teacher talk in this middle part. Um, it's all about having students to read silently or quietly to themselves. Even those beginning readers, you know, after I've had a chance to go through with them and they've done a little shared reading at first, then I want them to have a chance to whisper read or, or read quietly. Um, and it's not about round robin reading either. That's, that's a big fat no, no. That's, that's the way that I will tell you that I remember being a little girl and, and being, being taught that way. But I also, I was a good reader and I loved that part. I love to show off and be round robin reading, but so many of our students, that's, that's like a, that's like a, a negative thing for them. Um, and then others are, are just, you know, reading to show off or you, I have teachers say, well, my kids want to read. No. They might, they want to show off and reading that reading instruction has taken place in that small guided reading group is all about students being able to comprehend and check their decoding skills and work on their fluency so that Instead, all of our students should be assigned what to read. They need to have a, a specific amount to read. They need to have a specific kind of a time in your head. You have a timer. So what timers are for? In my kit, there's a timer. I set a timer. And I let the kids know up front what that time is. And then I give them look fors. I give them purpose for reading. And I start them reading. Sometimes I will start a kid. And then I'll move to another kid on the other side, start them. And, I, and if kids are, if they read, uh, out loud somewhat. They're not yet into silent reading yet. I will start them at staggered times a little bit, a few seconds behind each other. So they won't be reading the same thing at the same time. 
And I work my way around. It's all about working your way around, listening in. The most valuable teaching you can do during the day is that, that monumental time during that guided reading when you are listening in to find out what the kids can do and what you need to help them with next. And like if they're whisper read, if they're reading silently, you say, okay, when I come to you, I want you to whisper uh, read to me so that I get a chance to hear that. And I want to use that text to help the children expand what they know how to do as well as what I need to teach them next. Um, I want to think about those things. This is what we want to think about. We want to think about the strengths and the needs and the background knowledge of the group. And then I want to analyze the text that I'm using, you know, and I want to find those opportunities. And during, in my text, I will mark those opportunities. That I want to make sure I'm asking my students questions and I'm checking their engagement in the meaning and the language and in the print of the text itself. You know, when I see my kids sitting there, I want to be able to lean in and go, okay, so tell me why you thought that. Tell me why you read that that way. Uh, what do you think's happening here? So I'm checking for their decoding. I'm checking for their accuracy. I am checking for their fluency. Are they reading like jackrabbits or are they reading uh, too slowly or are they reading at a good pace? Are they phrasing well? Then I want to find out, are they understanding that, you know, uh, so, you know, which words from the selection best help you to, to picture that you tell me that you saw that, tell me what you saw there. Give me, give me the key details, you know, and again, that's what it looks like. It looks like them reading silently to themselves and, and a teacher getting a chance to listen in. Um, cause remember that we're scaffolding them while they're reading and we're doing it with, that's the teacher support because this is that time for them to get ready for that independent reading. Um, I want to see what's in their heads. I want to see what those conversations are. I want to listen into those and I want them to do that while, I'm, while they're there with me in that time. And I want to coach them. And if you'll notice there in those pictures, I have a little uh, lay around my neck. And that's because when I do guided reading many times, either I'll have a little crown on my head a guy, or a lay around my neck or I have a light on. I usually try to do something to signal to the other kids, that, hey, this right now, this is my time with these students. I uh, understand that, that uh, this signal is, is for that purpose. And if you can wait to ask me something, please do. Um, and understanding that sometimes those strategies do look different. You know, some need support with first letter cues. Others may need monitoring for comprehension or phrasing that vocabulary. Uh, I got to listen to my kids to find out what that is. And that during readings that time, a big a big thing to think about also during, during guided reading is meaningful struggle. As teachers, you know, we want to tell them the answers. We want to help them get it right. We want them to be successful. But what the research shows is that meaningful struggle is so helpful. It is, it is more help than telling the answers all the time rather than enabling them to think they can't do it on their own. So I'm going to allow them time. And that's guided reading is great for that. Uh, because I can come back to them and I can coach them and I can take a note to remind myself that the students struggle today with, with uh, blending sounds or with understanding a certain amount of the text. And then I can work on that for the next time. Uh, I say meaningful struggle, patience is a virtue. During reading, this is no, no, no time is more true for that than during guided reading. Uh, prompting. Uh, there's also some tools on my website about prompting. Um, we're prompting for decoding. We're prompting for fluency. We're prompting for comprehension. So there's certain questions that we can ask that can help us. You know, we don't have to remember all these things. We can have these things sitting there in front of us uh, because we forget in the, in the, the briskness and the, the hurry scurry of everyday teaching uh, what things we need to ask them that can really uh, bring that to fruition and get them to understand, like, look at that word again. There's no end in that word. Can you try that again? Uh, did that sound right? That look right? Uh, make that sentence sound like the character would say it. Um, you know, there's certain prompts we can get, really help them to, to be better readers during that time. Then, of course, when we finish that, we have that after reading time. And after reading um, is, is that ending piece where we're going to go back and check students' comprehension and we're going to have discussion questions that we have a couple of which we've shared with them before we read. That was that setting the purpose for that time, you know, because before reading, you know, any that before reading can be anywhere from uh, two to five to six minutes at the very most. Uh, during reading should be anywhere from, you know, five to 10 to 12 minutes times for them to read. And, and then the, the after reading is again, that, 
tallying that up into, you know, five minutes at the end uh, so that we check for student comprehension. And we give our kids a chance to talk together. That's another key part of after reading. Give them a chance to collaborate with each other, to check for comprehension, to share those conversations, to talk to their partners about what they've learned. Uh, on my website, I have these little uh, speaker and listener tools that I love to use to train my kids how to really be true listeners and speakers and have collaborative conversations and discussions. And because they don't crawl out of the womb being able to do that. And they need practice with that. And guided reading is a great place for them to practice that because I can really hear what they're doing and I can monitor that. Uh, we also want them to have a chance to write. Now they might not write every time and after, after reading, but they may, many times they can do the guided writing piece uh, and then, or else we can assign that for them, check their understanding of it and send them a way to do it because it gives us a chance to collect a writing sample and to check for their understanding. Response to text. Let's talk about that for a minute because that is really important. Uh, all of the park testing, smart balance testing, uh, end of grade testing, they're asking them to respond to text and have that understanding. So guided reading lessons should invite students to write confidently about what they read. And that small group instruction time helps, helps us to have time to make that happen in a more meaningful quality way. So if they want them to respond to text daily, sometimes we can use post-it notes. Kids love using post-it notes. So when they're with us in small group, you know, having them write on a post-it note, they're not afraid of that. Because the first question kids always ask, and if anybody disagrees, let me know. But they always say, how much do I gotta write? How much do I have to write? I have to write a whole page. Well, in this case, they have a sticky note. So they can write a response on that sticky note. And I can be right there to, to lean in and, and, and discuss it with them. And they can discuss it with their partners and they can share it out. Uh, and then they can bring back, as a matter of fact, they can do some reading when they're not with me and they can bring some of those stickies with them to uh, the small group for us to discuss, uh, which can also lead to that guided writing piece where they can write responses to what we've read in their, in their reader response journals, which is also a very valuable tool to have not only in small group reading, but also in, uh, in their whole group reading and their independent reading. So they also can have a chance to share out, you know, what they, how they've responded to text, uh, which gives them a chance to extend that comprehension. Uh, on my website, you'll see my, my Think Codes uh, anchor chart. Um, many of you probably are familiar with these. This is just giving kids focus, like we talked about. You know, they might be writing about their favorite part, a confusing part, something they wonder about, uh, things they figured out. And, you know, I love having teaching them how to do this coding because it can look like that because when they're not with us, they don't do a very good job of writing a whole sticky note. They tend to write a lot of stuff that's not really anything worth writing sometimes. So instead here, they're just they're they're like leaving little little breadcrumbs along the way that they can discuss with me later uh, or discuss with their partners later about what they're reading and then be able to write that out. So I would say that whole ending part is all about checking to see if they understood what they read and, and send it away with some clarity in that. Which brings us to another thing I like talking about graphic organizers and anchor charts. On my website, you'll see my website is always loaded with anchor charts. But we also know that a lot of our teaching that goes on in that small group, speaking of, of management, can all begin in whole class mini lessons. You know, I can take what I'm teaching in whole class mini lesson and I can move that over to the small group. Uh, guided reading where I'm able to take them into a text that's uh, maybe a little more on their levels and has um, given me an opportunity to extend what I've taught them in whole group um, so that I am anchoring that learning not only in whole group but also giving them a chance to anchor it over there in small group. Uh, anchor charts can be that chance for them to start out talking about key details and main topics so that when they come to small group with me uh, they're able to show me what they know in those graphic organizers. It's one of the things that uh, Carson and Delosa does well, I think, is they see the value of those graphic organizers that fit the task and fit the purpose. And so we want to, we definitely want our graphic organizers to do that. Any ones that we do use. Kathy, I have another question for you. How does guided reading support closed reading? Well, that's a great question because close reading is, is you know, if, you, if you're uh, following the, uh, the standards, 
the ELA standards uh, for the College Career Ready standards, we know that standard one is all about reading closely. It doesn't say close reading, it says reading closely. But close reading in today's world, we know how it's not, that's nothing new, but it is important. And close reading requires kids to reread, which is something they don't like to do because they think it's something negative. But in close reading, you know, we support that. We support them understanding why they reread. We do that through the teacher-led tasks. That is guided reading. That is a huge, guided reading can be one of those teacher-led tasks. Uh, we have them to reread for a purpose. We ask those discussion questions we've talked about, we, the essential questions. Uh, we give them a task, we write about it. We give them chances to collaborate and we ask text-based questions. Um, and that definitely supports them in that close reading. So they're rereading, they're rereading for a purpose. And we know how important that rereading for a purpose is. Um, on my website, uh, you will also find that there are, of course, uh, close reading bookmarks that I have there. And those are just kind of like the steps, the general steps that we use for close reading. And we can definitely follow this. We're following this in guided reading where they're marking big ideas and key details and looking for patterns and repetitions and similarities. And they're asking questions about why the author did that. And they're rereading and thinking they're looking for that big word text evidence. So guided reading can definitely support that, that close reading. What's the text say? How does a text say it? And uh, you know, what does that mean? And these tools can be found on my website. Okay, another question for you. How does guided reading improve students' abilities to navigate complex text? Wow, complex text. That's a very big uh, teacher buzz, buzz phrase in our, our recent years for sure. It's all about the complexity of text. It's all about them being able to navigate those texts. You know. That's, that's what College Career Ready is, is a lot about. It's about them being able to do that. I don't think you can act, I actually do not think you can, can do a good job, a successful job of getting kids to navigate complex text without using some guided reading, regardless of what age your students are, regardless of what ability levels they are. Uh, how does it support that? Well, let me just say that simply assigning hard books, complex text will not ensure that students learn at high levels. Uh, Everybody knows that. And so we have to not only, we can't just assign it, we have to teach them. We have to guide them. We have to give them opportunities to process. We have to give them strategies to navigate through text, to understand how to find, how to get through those tricky parts and how to take what they know. Um, our goal with complex text is to slow the reader down, which is another reason I like using the think codes and the sticky notes and having that collaboration time where we slow them down, we have them reread for a purpose, and we show them how much they can learn and enrich what they're learning through that ability to reread and to read closely. So guided reading definitely has the process that helps us to enhance and support uh, a student's ability to grow that close reading um, skill they need to have. Which brings us to this, comprehension strategies. Let's talk about comprehension strategies. Uh, they're included in the standards. The standards include comprehension strategies, things that good readers do when they read and they write. Um, I love this quote from Jan Richardson in the next steps in guided reading, when she says the goal in guided reading is not reading with hundred percent accuracy. It is using strategies. Your, your, your goal is to teach them how to use those strategies. So when they're not with you, they do think they do reread for a purpose. They do make connections. They do know how to begin to, to make inferences and draw conclusions um, and notice what the uh, author is doing. You know, reading is thinking. And, you know, many years ago, uh, I, in a particularly uh, rough year when I was teaching, uh, I had a group of students that I declare, I, I, was, I would say, let's think about that. And they would look at me like I had three heads. Like, what do you want me to think? I don't understand what you want me to think, Miss B. Tell me again. And so that's how I came up with think clouds. I was trying to think of a way to get them to think. And so on my website, you can find some of those little starters. Um, my husband calls them paper on a stick, or I used to call paper on a stick. He quit doing that. We realized they were valuable to kids to learn how to read. And so you can find those on my website. And it's something about holding that in your hands to help them to understand, this is what I want you to think. I want you to think the things that good readers think about. But getting, making that happen can be a challenge. I have a challenge question for you. 
Um, management of all this is a challenge. So do you have any tips for any of us? Well, just, yeah, I definitely do. And I'm, that's one of the things, that's one of the things I do in my job when I'm, when I'm working my way around the country, I'm talking about, you know, here's just a few things that I, I can say can help us, you know, without a doubt, I tell teachers all the time, we cannot teach school by the seat of our pants. We can't do it. We have to be prepared. How we set our rooms up is so important. You no, know, this is the end of a school year. And for many of us that are ending school years, you know, we're reflecting on what worked, what didn't work. Well, the first thing you need to look at is the setup in your classroom. You know, do I really, did this work? Did I, is this a, do I have enough room over here? You know, is this a problem over there? Do I have a room for my whole group? Do I have a place for them to collaborate? Do I have a place for that? So definitely be prepared. Uh, in the area that you have guided reading, you know, have your little, your things that there, your fix-up strategies, your comprehension charts, uh, things you want kids thinking about, uh, anchor charts you've worked on, um, whatever it happens to be that you're working on with your students, you know, have it nearby. Uh, be organized with those things, you know, have your kids' tools there, have your things there. This comes back to my little toolkit, there it is. Uh, that is just, that's an old, actually that thing came from Lowe's, it's an old toolkit. And I have all my little tools in there. I'm, I won't use all those tools every time, but I have the ones that I use a lot at my, try to have them at my fingertips so that if something comes up, I can have them. You know, what does it have in it? It's got, you know, it's got tools, it's got text, it's got markers, it's got pencils, it's got my clipboard with my uh, little class list and my anecdotal note thing on it. It's got question rings because I forget to ask the right questions. Uh, so I definitely, I would say having a little toolkit has my timer in there. You know, those are things that can really help uh, to be organized for that. I got to say that I don't care if I'm doing middle school guided reading. I have, a, I have a tabletop um, pocket chart and a little whiteboard. That tabletop allows me to kind of 3D vocabulary words, 3D essential questions, uh, 3D tasks that I want them to have. Uh, I have found this a very valuable thing to have. I want them to know what text we're going to be reading. I want those things to be right there in front of them. And having whatever questions I want them to be thinking about while they read front and center in their face, I think is one of the best management tips I can give, some, I can give teachers. You know, visuals, learning is visual. Our kids need the visuals. Uh, I need a schedule. I, I do, am I going to stick to that schedule 100% of the time? Well, absolutely not. Uh, that's impossible. But I can have those bones there. I can know that this is my goal. My goal is to have this happen. And these are my kids I got to meet with. And these are the things I want to have happen. I think this is another huge thing. Uh, this one's kind of wordy. I have some others that are, are a lot uh, less words like, you know, bring pencils, bring your books, bring your baggie, bring your toolkit, whatever I want them to bring. Um, but I want them to know what they do when they get there. I think clarity, procedures, and expectations. I want to anchor it. I want to talk to them about it. I want to post it. I want to remind them about it. And then when I'm in whole group and small group, another big, big tip I can give is empower those kids. Again, let them talk. Listen into what they have to say and then let them talk. You know, I hate to hurt our feelings, but our kids will learn as much from each other as they will learn from us. So letting them have the opportunity to teach each other is so valuable. Um, also keep in mind, this is another big tip. The composition of our guided reading groups isn't set in stone. They got to be fluid. They got to change as students needs change. Sometimes I just want to change them around to give them a chance to read because they have interest levels and then switch them back so that I'm working on those similar skills and strategies levels. Um, that's where our informal and formal assessments come in handy. That's a whole nother workshop, whole nother webinar to talk about assessments that are formal and informal. But, you know, and different schools and different districts use different ones and we have different things. But I have some very simple ones. There's some simple ones on my website, as a matter of fact, that they can definitely access. So I have another question for you. It's a pretty big question. Mm. What are the other kids doing while the teacher is conducting the small group instruction? Well, that is the question of the hour, I am sure. And that is a whole nother webinar too. Um, 
but let me just say that, you know, when, when they're not with me, I need to prepare them for when they're not with me. And when do I do that? When they're in whole group, I want to make sure everybody hears what I say and tell them what they're supposed to be doing. I want them to know what they're supposed to do. I always had a little rule two before you do. Some people have three before me, but I'm going to tell you, if you, you even have one or the other, so they know who they can go talk to. They know uh, what they're supposed to do and why they're doing something and what they're supposed to do. It's definitely not new learning. It should, but it shouldn't be something that it should not be a bunch of what I, what we call uh, shut up sheets or worksheets. It should instead be things that are meaningful. Um, they should be doing meaningful literacy activities and extensions. And one of the major things they should be doing in these activities is reading and rereading. And so I've got, I set those expectations and, and it's not new learning. It's chances to practice and deepen and evaluate what they're learning. And, they need to be writing about what they're reading and they need to be doing responses and they need to be talking. They, they could be doing this together. As a matter of fact, uh, their tasks can be collaborative, you know, with those rules set in place about that collaboration and they need to be paired with someone that, that I assigned. I tell teachers all the time, let's think about this. Kids in kindergarten through eighth grade cannot pick their own partners. They make bad choices. I need to pick those partners for that purpose. And I need to have them to have somebody they can go to when, I, when, they're, not, when they're not exactly there with me. And I need them talking, because I need them talking about what they're reading, talking about what they're learning. And they can do that when I'm in small group, as long as they learn the rules of the, of the size of voice they use, as well as you know, how, how to stay on topic. Uh, they can be working on vocabulary and word work and they and many of our, our K1s in their literacy centers uh, they have word work and working on alphabetic principle and, and phonics and phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. Uh, but definitely overall what they're doing is meaningful task and on my website there's a thing called literacy work board activities and I'd like to invite everybody to, to find those and uh, no, and you can they're adjustable you can uh, type in your own and again, all the things on my website are free. So uh, feel free to find those and put those on cards and you can give kids choices as well as assign them with those. You also want them to be accountable. So another thing you can find on my website is are some reading logs. Um, they kind of look like this because the kids are filling them out. Uh, you can quickly look at this. It's a great little sheet to look at, to share with parents. This is what the kids are reading. And by the way, these are reading logs for at school, what they're doing when they're not with me. Uh, I also have a rubric. Uh, I have a couple of rubrics actually, but this one in particular is about reading responses and uh, a chance for them to, when they're responding to reading, these are things that they should include in that read response. And they don't have to always be asking me about it. And they can also have peers to help them with that. And they can find copies of these on my website. Uh, another thing that really helps with all of this we've talked about are the literacy tools and visual teaching and learning. I just wanted to let them know what is there. And I want you guys to know that. Um, whether you giving these things to your kids, to your students is, imp is important that they have access to some of these. But I, of course, I don't give them these things unless they have been um, using them with me in whole group as a, as a um, coaching thing or in small group as a coaching thing. Uh, these are just some of the things that I have that, that are available on my website. This is one of my favorites. It's the, it's the comprehension walk. Um, kind of looks like this. You notice on the left, that is a student uh, doing a retail uh, after a guided reading group. Uh, I have them, have them for fiction, have them for nonfiction. I actually have specific ones for kindergarten. So this is very helpful for them to have. Uh, then we have smaller versions. They're the genre comprehension think marks. Uh, these are great management tools because they, they give you teach with these with, to the kids and the kids take them away to know what to ask questions about when they are reading and writing themselves. They're think marks for applying their, their reading comprehension independently. Uh, I have text evidence finders that are on there because obviously um, they need to know how to, show, how to find text evidence, how to key details and clues in their text. And these can help us to see if the kids are on the right track. Um, so these are great little tools to use too. And then the think clouds that I talked about earlier are on there as well and the comprehension strategies chart that kind of gives you some ways to express that understanding of what they're reading and writing. I also have uh, some Bloom's box that are questions and when you see them, they're kind of self-explanatory. If you have questions about them, you can definitely email me and ask me about these, but these are just some, some tools that, can, that are visuals, that are hands-on, that can help you to uh, 
teach your kids and send them away so they can uh, work with each other to learn. Uh, another thing you'll find on my website are my literacy wheels. Uh, these little wheels are like, what are they? They're CDs. Uh, let's face it with bling on them and um, marker. Um, these are Sharpies and these are, this, what you see here is my, is my fiction and nonfiction wheel. And they put it on their finger or on a dowel or on a pencil. They turn it away from themselves. They spin it and they put their finger out and, and find a, they stop it on a jewel or, or a, whatever type of a, of a thing you have on there. And then they turn it around and that's what they ask you about, or that's what they tell you about, or that's what you ask them about. And there's multiple ways to use them. For instance, this is a great way to use them in nonfiction text. This is, um, um, of course, text features and they might land on the parentheses and then they have to find an example of parentheses uh, being used in a text and talk about, you know, what they're being used for. So, you know, pretty much we're talking about, having things that are visual. It's one of my, one of my best tips I can give. They need things that help them to extend what they're learning. Kathy, I think you have some other exciting news about resources. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? I would love to, because I really am excited about this. I know that one of the problems and the challenges that teachers have uh, is finding resources, is having enough, you know, guided reading really presents that, you know, I've seen teachers spend hours and hours running around book rooms trying to find stuff, uh, or, you know, running out of, of guided reading group uh, resources at different levels. Um, it's also a huge challenge sometimes to find, uh, you know, those that are interesting and colorful. So, you know, one of the things that, that, that really draws me to, that really made me want to have this webinar was to be able to share uh, these very affordable, love that too, that's a key thing for us as teachers, you know, we don't make any money, so we need things that are affordable. When we go to our, our administration to get them to buy things, you know, it needs to be affordable. If we have to buy them ourselves, it needs to be affordable. Um, but these are great because they're guided reading sets. And um, one of the things that, that I can say they're ready to go, they're time saving, it helps with planning, help, they can be used in all the ways I talked about to enhance and supplement the things that you use already. Um, and the ones that, that are available now are set up on with a basis of these four reading strategies, which are included in our uh, standards you know, connect, question, summarize, and infer. Um, so there's 36 readers in each one. And uh, there's include below and on and above levels. And there's six in each title. And they have appealing topics. I mean, there's some in there about, about roaches. There's stuff in there about gross stuff that kids like, they really like, and very interesting topics that they like as well. They love animals. They love things about, um, about strange animals and amazing animals in the world and about toys and games and about severe weather. Um, and the thing is that you, you go into the, the, um, the readers themselves and, and they're laminated and you just punch them out. You don't have to copy them on the copy machine. You don't have to print them out and fold them and staple them. Instead, you just tear them out, pop them out and they're laminated and you've got a six pack to use with your, with your select group, the group that it's appropriate for. And the, I think the other neat thing about these are they strengthen the foundational reading skills with level reading and high interest topics. I, you know, I don't know what else to say other than they, that they're filled with charts, filled with photos, they have lots of text features and they really are valuable for that informational we, text. We know now with, uh, within the last several years, we've really learned the value of balancing out that informational text. And so we're always trying to find really appropriate, uh, interesting informational text about topics that kids want to read about renewable energy, as we said, cockroaches and lots of other things. Uh, all the readers, they, this is what I love. They all include discussion guides. Well, thank you because I know when I was talking about asking questions and things, and that's why I shared my question stems with you, my little rings and things, but you know, they've got discussion guides specific to that text. Uh, they've got graphic organizers, some of the ones I shared a while ago. They've got leveled readers that have intriguing topics, and they have prompts. They have prompts that help us to encourage students to, to pay attention to text features, to pay attention to author's word choice, to pay attention to a topic and learn more about it. And so throughout these little, these little readers, they're able 
to apply their reading strategies for the text, and then they have writing prompts. Yay! There is nothing more important than integrating that reading and writing together. And sometimes we're struggling to make that happen. Um, and I tell teachers all the time, in, in, the, in the new world of teaching, reading and writing are married. And there's no divorce in literacy. It's got to happen. Our kids can't be college career ready without that. And so in this case, they are uh, applying those reading strategies. And, you know, like they, they start out with predictions and then they make, they work with vocabulary and then they have questions and they can also have opinions. We know the value of that now, having students have opinions that are text-based and have evidence. Um, included in all the readers is an observation sheet. Uh, I have a few on my website, but this one is great. This is before reading, during, and after reading. What are you looking for? Yes or no? And being able to quickly, see this is a quick sheet. It's not, it's not anything that takes a lot of writing and a chance to take notes about our individual students as we read with them. You know, there's, there's, there's the books that have about the questions. And um, again, if you look at them, you can see there's the discussion guide I was talking about. There's the graphic organizer I was talking about. And they come in grade spans of one, two, three, four, and five, six, uh, and, and, and the different levels within those grade level spans. So, you know, you have um, resources that are available for all of our grade levels. We talk about summarizing. Summarizing is hard to teach, but the, the readers that uh, Carson Delos is offering here uh, are of great high interest and gives them a chance to summarize and it has step by step. This is nothing. I, this is one thing I really got excited about uh, because sometimes when I'm coaching teachers, I will literally have like little post-it notes, like step one, step two, step three. Let's help you with this. Wow. I think y'all stole that. Uh, y'all stole that from me. No kidding. Uh, because you've got it there. Like, like they know here, they're going to be summarizing. They're going to briefly tell the main ideas and they're reading about amazing animals. And step one, they're going to read the titles. They're going to scan the text. They're going to look at the picture in the chart. What do you think the reader is about? What's this going to be about? Then they roll into the vocabulary. Here's the vocabulary, and it's got the number two over there. So the kids also know where to go. Their eyes go to the next step. Uh, then they go to three. What are the big ideas and supporting details? That's, the, that's what they're working on there. And then four, they refer to the illustrations. So they're always working on text features. And then five, wow. I love this, I love this. This really stole my heart. Read the text again. Oh, you mean they gotta actually reread? That is fabulous, so excited about that. Um, so as you can see, there's their right they have a graphic organizer for it and they have discussion questions. Connect the same way, making connections, informational texts. Um, this is one of the ways I used to do that with a um, little trifold board. I used to have my kids make connections and they used to write sticky notes and did it that way because it was important for them to understand that. Infer, we know how tough that is. And, and in this case, there's some great readers in there. One of my favorite stories is in the three, four grade span. It's one called Unique Me. I'm sorry, Unique You. And it talks about how, how everybody is different. It talks about fingerprints. And um, it talks about uh, different things that um, fingerprints have on them and, and why they're different. And, it, and I did this, did this particular lesson with some kids and they, I'm telling you what, they could not quit looking at their fingers. They were so fascinated with it. And the first thing one of the kids did when they left my, left my group was they ran straight to an iPad and I walked over there to see what they were doing and they were looking up fingerprints. And all I could do was say, yay, because that, that definitely motivated that kid to want to learn more about that so you know I'm, I'm so excited about about the um the product itself and about the opportunities it gives us at a very great price to have some great resources in our classrooms okay i just want to give a short reflection before i let kathy finish up so i just wanted to let you all know that i appreciate you attending Hope you loved our guided reading webinar. And I wanna let you know that our guided reading series, they are $19.99 a book. And so that's great value. You get everything that Kathy discussed in it. And if you have any questions, um, you can let Kathy or I know. I, my number, or my, I'm sorry, my email was on um, the Zoom webinar. So you can email either one of us. And please don't hesitate to visit carsondelosa.com for all your upcoming needs for teaching. So I'll turn it back over to Kathy. Thank you. And let me just say final reflections. I so appreciate each and every one of you attending today. And, and hopefully you've got at least one idea that you can use. Please feel free to 
to go to my website. You can email me through my website or my email is kbumreading at yahoo.com. Be glad for you to, to um, contact me that way and ask me questions. Uh, let me just end by saying you can bring them to water and you can make them drink. You just got to put the right stuff in the bowls. And so definitely, you know, literacy tools, visual tools, visual literacy, uh, great resources. That's what we need. And I, I definitely want to thank Carson Alessa for sponsoring this today and for giving us an opportunity to talk about something as important as guided reading. So, you know, what stuck with you today? I hope that you have some ideas. And I definitely want to thank you and Carson Delosa for a, a great afternoon. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone.